So um, we're going to continue with our Mark commentary. This is session number 30. And we will try to do half of chapter 7 of Mark, which my Bible here calls the debate or discussion of Pharisaic traditions. And then uh, we'll do the second part uh, next time on a couple of cures, maybe even get into chapter 8. And then uh, after that with chapter 9 and the transfiguration, we're going to be moving along uh, some much more, well, at least uh, richer territory, for me anyway, with the uh, chapter 11 on the temple, which is what I did my doctoral dissertation on. So there should be a lot more to say about that than 12, than 13. And so the rest of what uh, is in store for us, God willing, should be um, quite rich, as they say, and, and interesting, hopefully. Um, chapter 7 uh, is one of these debates with the Pharisees and scribes that have come from Jerusalem. So again, we have this sort of situa ge geographical situation where you have the capital, the seat of, let's say, learning and, and, and Jewish orthodoxy. Uh, and then Galilee, which is a name which comes from the Hebrew Galil Hagoyim, meaning the region of the Gentiles, the pagans. So Jesus comes from uh, a part of Israel that was... I think, uh, appropriated by Josiah when he was able to expand the uh, limits of his uh, kingdom. And even though these were real Jews, not Samaritans who are to the south, nevertheless, it was known as not the capital, for example. Uh, and they have, of course, that famous accent that uh, Peter is recognized by um, when he um, is at the high priest's uh, house on the night of the uh, arrest of Jesus, etc., and they recognize him to be a Galilean by virtue of his uh, Galilean accent. And so, um, again, to repeat some of the things we've said before, but repetition would be the the way to have these things uh, be retained. You have uh, definitely a developed or developing Pharisaic halakha, as it's known, uh, come from the verb to walk, how to conduct yourself, but it really applies to the legal interpretation of the Pharisees as to what the Torah requires. When we say Torah, we mean the written Torah, the first five books of Moses, the fundamental constitution of Judaism. But according to Pharisaic tradition, uh, there was also an oral Torah delivered to Moses and handed on orally to Joshua, and then uh, I think to Samuel and uh, some of the prophets and the men of the great assembly, I think in Hebrew would be the Anshei Hakeneset Gadol. And so then you would have this tradition literally transmitted, just like in Catholicism, uh, until in Judaism it is codified in the Talmud around you know 400 or 500 AD in Catholicism you don't have tradition codified quite like that you may have it 
well represented in the fathers of the church. There's not a, a, a book or a collection of books that would have the tradition of the church written down. It is just as binding as the scripture. Unlike the Protestant position of sola scriptura, scripture alone, no tradition, even though it's very difficult not to have a tradition, implicit or explicit. Everybody interprets the scriptures according to their tradition, however you want to conceive that. But in any case, uh, to really understand the Phar Pharisees, we have to understand them as a reform movement uh, that arose in the time of the Maccabee dynasty, very zealous to preserve the purity of, of Judaism. And, um, you know, it's a very noble uh, intention. Uh, the Jewish people were elected uh, to be God's own uh, segula, its own stash treasure. I was just reading um, Bernard Henri Levy on, on, on this. And so, um, one of the things you do is you build a fence around the Torah, as the Mishnah says, Avot, and you stop short of anything that might come close to being a violation of the Torah. So, for example, in a sort of positive sense, if the Torah allows 40 lashes, the uh, the tradition would say, stop at 39, lest you by mistake overstep. And so um, I think we have to understand that Christianity arises in a context in which the Pharisees are gaining the, have, are gaining the upper hand. The Sadducees were not popular and linked very closely with the temple and its sacrificial system. They were mostly priests. And so when the temple is destroyed in 70 AD, thus disappears, dis disappear the Sadducees. And in the Talmud themselves, even though they're not explicitly mentioned by name, I think the Boethians would be the, the Pharisees, uh, the Sadducees rather, the Pharisees, uh, in the form of the rabbis, will then be the uh, the ones who take over Judaism, being the more adaptable ones. They don't need a temple. They study the Torah. They are progressive in the sense that they adapt uh, Torah in the sense of revelation of God, both written and oral, uh, to changing history, changing situations. So in that sense... Uh, for our own appreciation of Judaism, we have to understand what the Pharisees represented, and they're not exactly these ogres that the New Testament tends to present. But there were the, these debates, whether they occurred in the time of Jesus or not, I think some of them must have. If Jesus is really in-gathering all Israel and in-gathering or having meals with sinners and unclean people who don't tithe and aren't scrupulous about following the law, what the Jewish tradition would call the Amha'aretz, these ignoramuses, unscrupulous Jews, um, then um, I think that... Um, You know, you have to understand uh, what these debates were like. The Pharisees were, would object to a, a rabbi or an informal rabbi such as Jesus. Uh, you know, opposing their attempts at rigorous application of Jewish uh, law, and especially this Holocaust, this... Uh, tradition being developed of what the Torah really requires. And one of the things would be washing a certain way. So here, uh, this washing is depicted negatively. Uh, I kind of follow, sometimes we say in Spanish, llevar la contraria, devil's advocate. In the Middle Ages, the Jews sometimes uh, survived the plagues better because they washed. <laughs> 
whereas the Christians did not. So cleanliness is next to godliness, etc. But here this debate is really focused in terms of exterior observances with neglect of interior dispositions and focus on a ritual and body as opposed to conscience and soul. And so um, the New Testament will have a very radical position. We have to understand that. The letter to the Hebrews in chapter 9 basically says that the Jewish rituals are for cleaning the body but cannot cleanse uh, the guilt of your, your mind or soul or conscience. And so in Judaism, there is some debate sometimes as to whether sins can even be forgiven, deliberate sins. I think the position of people like jo uh, Jacob Milgram is that on Yom Kippur, these peshaim or brazen offenses that in numbers are not forgivable are forgiven. And there is a sin offering uh, called the asham, which also deals with guilt and not just with uh, ritual pollution. Like, for example, you had sex or you had a child or you stepped on a corpse or a woman was menstruating or something, and then you do a ritual. But you can actually do something else that is more reparation, etc. I'm not going to get into Jewish law because I'm not an expert even though I, I have a, a, an interest in it. But here the debate is, uh, why don't your disciples wash? They eat with defiled or, or common hands, etc. And then Jesus says that the, his opponents are so fixated on uh, the ritual externals that they find ruses, legal loopholes and legal tricks to avoid the weightier obligations God makes in favor of lesser things they've come up with. And this Korban thing, this I offered it to God, therefore it's in trust. My property is in trust in the temple and I can't help my parents. Jesus considers this tantamount to killing your um, the financially dependent parents uh, and certainly not honoring them, which is the commandment that has uh, one of the commandments that says, I think says the ones that you're going to have a long life if you honor your father and mother. And so therefore, um, Mark comes out eventually with the atomic bomb Jesus is declaring all foods clean. Of course, this throws out Leviticus out the, um, the window. And so um, what you have is really uh, abrogation of, of the Torah as understood in Judaism, which of course would be a major, major innovation. Uh, there are other instances. My professor Blenkingsop spoke about uh, admission of eunuchs and, um, and foreigners in Isaiah 56, verses 6 and 7, as prophetic abrogation of Deuteronomy 23. So that even within Judaism, you may have prophetic uh, abrogations of things said in the Torah, which then may be copyists and scribes then take care to mitigate or soften, etc., as is done in many cases. But here you have Mark dropping the bomb. Jesus declares all foods clean. Luke is going to be much more gradual. He's going to wait till Acts of the Apostles, chapter 10, for a vision for Peter of unclean animals on the roof that he eats, etc., that's told to eat them, so that he can then go to Cornelius the centurion's house, a pagan, and eat with him, for which he gets flack, and which then will uh, be straightened out in the so-called Council of Jerusalem in Acts 15. But in any case, um, in any case, uh, I think that... Um, you know, we have here uh, certainly a very Christian viewpoint 
of uh, what Jesus uh, has done. And we're going to have to continue this a little later because I think this is going to be relevant to this pre-fall Torah that Harmut Stegemann uh, spoke about that I've mentioned before, but I'm going to have to explain this much more slowly, keeping this to 15 minutes or so. I'm going to have to stop here.